This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Imagine this. You're mustering sheep and you see, sticking out of the ground, a bone. A thigh bone. A femur. This is a thigh bone of a sheep, and it's not what you found. This is a thigh bone of a cow. Imagine a femur bigger than me. It had belonged to an animal at least 20 metres from nose to tail. It had belonged to a sauropod, like this one. And you wouldn't expect to find it out here. But this is where the bone was found. Luckily for me, sauropods don't live here anymore. But once upon a time, there were herds of them out here. Once upon a time, there were monsters in the outback. This is a program about dinosaurs, about monsters in the outback, what they were, how they lived, and how it is that 65 million years after they vanished, we can piece together their story. Dinosaurs have been found almost everywhere. Actually, almost everywhere but Australia, where until recently, very little evidence and none of the real giants had been found. And then something happened which revolutionised our understanding of Australia's dinosaurs. It happened in Queensland, near a place called Winton. Winton has the look of a place that's never changed. You can't help thinking that it must have looked like this forever. In fact, it's changed a lot. These grasslands were once watered by meandering rivers and filled with towering plant life. And the rulers of this landscape were giants. It was a time when monsters like the plant-eating sauropods ruled the earth. They were in charge. They were enormous. But some of their cousins were not. Some were the size of a chicken. Some were the size of the family dog. Or a cow. They came in all shapes and sizes. And then they vanished all of them, about 65 million years ago. Most scientists believe a giant meteor slammed into the Gulf of Mexico, sending up clouds of dirt and dust blocking the sun, causing temperatures to fall and creating an awful cold that wiped out much of life on Earth. The story of human beings started long after that event, long after the age of the giants. The death of the last dinosaurs and the emergence of our ancestors are events separated by tens of millions of years. The first evidence of these creatures confused people. Dragons, they said. Giants. But gradually the truth dawned that the evidence was pointing to a whole new class of extinct creatures. Scientists gave them a name, which means terrible lizard. And since those first discoveries, barely 200 years ago, their evidence has been found just about everywhere. And outback Queensland seems to have been a particularly popular home, or hunting ground, to a number of different species of the terrible lizard. The Greek word for which is dinosauros. If you love history, then you'll love History Hit. Our extensive library of documentary features everything from the ancient origins of our earliest ancestors to the daring mission to sink the Bismarck. History Hit has hundreds of exclusive documentaries with unrivaled access to the world's best historians. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and Timeline fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. 
The dinosaurs that roamed the outback were different from those that have been found in other parts of the world. We can never see them in real life, but we can imagine what they look like. This is an ornithopod. He's a local, and we can tell by his footprints that he was pretty quick. Discovering him and all the other creatures that once called this place home has happened because of a chance find made by David Elliott. The Elliots have been sheep and cattle farmers in the Winton district for several generations. This is David's property, Belmont. He was mustering sheep on the place when he found the monster thigh bone that started our story. David is taking me to the site of that historic discovery. David Elliott's find, which triggered unprecedented excitement, was identified as the thigh bone from a sauropod, now fittingly nicknamed Elliot. So this is the site where you first found Elliot? Yep, yep, this is where we found Elliot. So I've seen the size of the femur. I mean, was it sticking up out of the ground? Did you almost trip over no, it? Or? No, it was funny really, because what I was happening, I was mustering a mob of sheep and I was trying to bring them to the bull, which is about a kilometre or so to the other side of us here. And of course, when you've got sheep that don't want to go where, they, where you're trying to make them go, and I was just going backwards and forwards here, probably pretty cranky, and I had to swerve the bike to miss a bunch of rocks. As I went past, I thought, that's not your average rock. So I had sheep going that way, I had sheep going that way, and I still turned around and went back. Yeah, I still so went back. So it was actually the sheep that led you to the, the dinosaur sheep led me to the, Yeah, <laughs> that's it, yeah. And we knew that if we brought it up and brought it home, we'd never get any work done for a week and we were really busy, so we purposely left it here and it was here for a year. So you yeah. just left the bone yeah, there? Yeah, they stay there. Okay, yeah, well. yeah, as you do. But we did finally pick it up. So we collected everything, we took it back to the house and we had it on a big old ping-pong table in the house. But as we were fitting them together, this bone got bigger and bigger, so eventually we had a bone about this wide across the base and, and uh, this shape. And you could see it was the end of a leg bone. David and his wife Judy knew they had something special. So David invited the Queensland Museum to come and have a look. At this stage, I had nothing to do with paleontology. I, I ran the property, you know, and yeah. that's what I did. So I just brought them in, thinking, oh, yeah, I'll say, oh, yeah, it's definitely dinosaur bone, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they walked in, and I just remember one of the girls sitting back and saying, wow, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so the Queensland Museum organised a small group of their own people. So there's about six or seven of them who came out, lived in our shearing quarters for a week. They were determined that they'd see if there was more. A team of paleontologists from the Queensland Museum put in a huge effort with shovels and crowbars, but after a week of digging, they still hadn't found anything. They concluded the chance discovery of a partial thigh bone they had dubbed Elliot was an isolated fragment rather than part of a still hidden skeleton. David Elliot was not convinced. He's a farmer and he knows the unique characteristics of the soil in these parts. So what made you think that you needed to get them to dig deeper? When you look at this black soil country, like, it just looks all the same, but it's not just a layer that goes all the way down for 10, 20, 30 metres deep. It's only one metre deep. And what it is, is the weathering layer. So that's there. You probably need to go and look where it might have come from rather than look where it is at the moment. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I sort of had a pretty fair idea that that's probably what we should be doing. That's why I sort of said, look, you know, we need to get below, get all this black soil off and then have a look underneath, which is what uh, we suggested to them. So you've decided that you're going to dig further. We brought the tractor out that afternoon and, you know, we just kept digging away and digging away and I got down about a metre and we were very lucky because we dug pretty well exactly over the top of where the bone was. We could have been 10 metres away and not even found it, but we were very lucky. We were right on top of it. I was just digging and dumping, you know, and go and get another load and dump it. And Judy was just there with a shovel going through the mounds to see, you know, if there was anything. Sifting. Next minute she starts waving her hands, you know, and I said, what's, what's gone? She said, it's got something, I'm thinking, so oh, I said, oh, go on, you know, so I jumped off the tractor and I went across and had a look. It was the end of the femur. It was the opposite end of the femur that I had found. The base had already come to the top probably thousands of years ago, all broken down to little pieces. The head was still in one big piece, down about a metre, and then underneath that was the shaft. So we thought, hmm, well, we'll wait till the Queensland Museum blokes turn up. They're going to turn up sometime or other. And, and uh, he looks at it and he said, what's that? I said, what do you think it is? And he grabs it and tips it over, and oh, they're slapping us on the back. Dr. Scott Hucknell is a vertebrate paleontologist and senior curator at the Queensland Museum's Geosciences Department. 
He was one of the first academics to respond to David's discovery and has been involved with Winton's dinosaurs ever since. So this is where it all began. This is Elliot. Yeah, this is the Elliot femur. Well, when we went into his dining room and David shows us this big chunk of bone, even that fragment at the time was just a blow away. Our mouths were wide open, we were just, just looking at this thing going, wow, that's a huge dinosaur, even just from a fragment. But you wouldn't have found it without the bulldozer. That's right. It's kind of ironic. This amazing natural history revolution where we're finding more dinosaurs than we ever have in the past revolves around one thing, using a big loader. So paleontologists before Elliot, they weren't using big equipment? Well, most of the discoveries would have been found just like the first bit of Elliot on the surface, and paleontologists going out there would have simply picked the stuff up off the surface, collected it, brought it back to the museum, and that was it. Their, their concept of fossils out there was basically that the layer which had the bone in it had disappeared, and, uh, and what was left is all you had. But in fact, it's the opposite way around. The stuff that was on the surface was just the tip of the iceberg. Everything else was underneath the ground. Have we found anything like it before? Not something this big. So we made the big announcement that this was Australia's largest dinosaur. But the fact is that that just led on to all these new discoveries with huge dinosaurs. And the exciting thing from that point of view is that what we have here is just the tip of the iceberg, just the start of one of the most amazing periods in Australian natural history. David Elliott's discovery triggered Australia's dinosaur revolution. It was now time to discover what other secrets were buried in the Winton region. Nothing we can see in Winton today gives any clue to the prehistoric landscape. Isolated from other land masses, Australia would become home to unique flora and fauna. The country around Winton was once forested wetland adorned with lush vegetation. It can be hard to imagine unless you have the knowledge of a local farmer or of a scientist. Dr Alex Cook, a paleontologist and once senior curator of geosciences at the Queensland Museum, was one of the first paleontologists to become involved in digging for bones in this part of the world. Now, I hear that you're one of the first paleontologists that actually went out to the discovery site. How was that? It was awe-inspiring. The first time we laid eyes on the first bone of Elliot, we knew we had a very, very large dinosaur, much larger than anything that had been ever found before on the Australian continent. And when we went to the site, we realised that there were bones strewn over 400 metres so that we knew we were going to have the biggest dinosaur dig ever to have happened in Australia. So it was a very exciting time. So that was pretty significant for Australian paleontology then. I mean, how much work had been done before that? Been a little bits and pieces done on, on the fossil dinosaurs of Queensland. Not a huge amount, but the finds that had been made had been made by chance. This one, also made by chance, was the first time we systematically dug a huge excavation for a dinosaur. I've been seeing some pretty spectacular landscape around here, but what am I actually looking at? The landscapes in this area are made up of rocks of the Winton Formation. And the Winton Formation is a group of rocks which makes up the youngest part of the Great Artesian Basin. They were deposited here between 98 and 95 million years ago on environments such as river plains, in lakes, in creeks and streams. These were environments where dinosaurs thrived and we get those animals preserved in the rocks of the Winton Formation. What is it about the geology which gives it that exceptional preservation characteristics? A couple of things happened after the deposition of the Winton Formation. It was buried fairly quickly, so we have lots of sediment pouring into the Great Artesian Basin and that helped preserve the fossils and the dinosaur bones in particular. And so what have all these finds meant for Australian paleontology? In the last 10 years, there have been so many new discoveries of dinosaurs around the Winton district that this has added a great deal to the international interest in what's here in Australia and the fact that we do actually have dinosaurs, despite looking for 100 years, and that there are different types and there's a unique fauna of dinosaurs. And do we still have more work to go? At the moment, there's about 60 dinosaur sites on the books that haven't been uh, dug up. So there's 
enough work there probably for the next 90 or so years. <laughs> It'll keep you busy. Keep me busy. For scientists, such as geologists and paleontologists, investigating the history of our planet can be a bit like rummaging through garbage. You have to reach in, find what's under the surface and look at what's been buried and forgotten with the passage of time. Plants and animals may change over the generations, but rocks, and anything trapped in them, stay the same. Rocks might erode, crack or get buried, but they don't evolve, which is why rummaging can tell us about a fabulously remote past. Remains have been found hereabouts of many species of life, from huge petrified trees and dinosaur bones to tiny insects and pollen grains. Some are common, but others haven't been found anywhere else. So what do we mean when we say the remains? What can be left of something that died 60 or 70 or 100 million years ago? The answer, surprisingly, is quite a lot, thanks to a process known as fossilisation. We owe almost all that we know about the prehistoric world to fossils. Fossils need very particular circumstances if they are to be formed and if they are to survive. Winton gets it just right. So why Winton? Why all the dinosaurs out here? To find a dinosaur, you've got to be looking at an area where a dinosaur was living at the time it died. So the Winton deposits, for instance, are around 95 million years old. That's within the age of dinosaurs. The dinosaurs lived around 245, 250 million years ago, right through to 65 million years ago. That's when they were here. But the Earth's about four and a half billion years old. So they weren't around the whole time. And so it depends on the age of the deposits that you live in. Like this is a prime area because this is what we call our ashy country. Okay. What we call our ashy country is that very fine silt deposits. The whole of our country isn't like that. It's only just patches. What we're looking at is the bottom of ancient water holes. So a bit the same as today, as a sheep or a cow dying, they die, get bogged in the bottom of dams. Those bones get covered over with mud and they could be preserved for someone else to find later on. But a bone of a dead sheep, say, out in the paddock, out in the dry out here, it'll just break down the sun. It, it'll be gone within 10 years. So mud and silt is the best mm, kind of yeah, soil? Yeah, water. Yep, that's right. And that seems to be the secret. And so it was 100 million years ago when dinosaurs were walking around it here. When an animal dies, it usually disappears. To become a fossil, it has to die in the right place, a place where the bones will be protected and preserved. The Winton fossil bones have been preserved in the bottoms of billabongs, swamps and river channels that covered the area 95 million years ago. Over time, sediments built up on top of the bones, burying them under hundreds of metres of soil. But if we're going to stumble across fossils, natural forces need to bring them back toward the surface. So, David, I'm no farmer, but you appear to put your fence post in crooked. I didn't actually put them in. Someone, someone I followed did them about 100 years ago. Uh -huh. And I think he probably put them in straight. And he also put them in a fair bit further than the ground where they are now, too. So what's happened? Well, what's happened is that these... Uh, these posts have worked their way out of the ground. And so we've got a whole fence line where, that used to have your bottom wire about that far off the ground, and now it's that far off the ground. The topsoil in the area where David farms, known as black soil, has a characteristic described as self-mulching. As the soil dries, it cracks open deep into the ground. When rain falls, the loose layer of surface soil and pieces of plant matter are washed to the bottom of the cracks. As this process is repeated, it has a rotational effect on the soil profile, lifting it slightly every time. Over thousands of years, as the surface of the earth erodes away, the cracks extend deeper into the ground. Once they've extended below a dinosaur bone or other object, that object becomes part of the rotating soil profile and so gets slowly brought to the surface. But fossils can't tell the experts everything. Often a fossil can tell us what, but not why. 
so we need to make an educated guess. Matabarasaurus here could walk on her hind legs or on all fours. Her bivorous and seven metres long. But here's the special thing with this creature. Mutt had a big, bulbous, hollow-chambered snout. But what for? The best guess is it amplified the animal's roar. But we don't actually know that it roared. Perhaps it had the world's loudest squeak. But we do know a lot, considering how much the world has changed. If dinosaurs came back to the Earth today, they wouldn't recognise this place. Not just because of the cities we've built, or the forests we've felled, or all the other ways with which we've shaped our landscape, but because the land masses of the world today really are in a different shape. By looking at rocks identical in one place to those in a faraway country, scientists can tell that land now apart was once joined. Our understanding of the supercontinent Pangaea comes from such evidence. We also know that Gondwana broke away from Pangaea and that Australia broke away from Gondwana. Scientists can also prove that the continents that broke away from that original landmass are still on the move. But don't worry, we're drifting terribly slowly. In fact, if you stayed in the one place from the moment of your birth, you'll have moved about seven metres by the time of your hundredth birthday. That's about the same speed as the growth of your toenail. But when we're looking at the geological record, we're calculating periods of time over hundreds and millions of years, and then distances become immense. Four and a half thousand kilometres of continental drift since the age of the dinosaurs. And one of the astonishing things that has been discovered since Elliot is how many different types of dinosaurs once inhabited the Winton district. Elliot the sauropod was one of the most significant discoveries of dinosaur life in this part of the world. But he wasn't the first. As far back as 1865, fossils from marine reptiles, such as ichthyosaurs, had been found near Hewenden. By the early 20th century, numerous other finds of marine animals had been made around Richmond, and odds and ends have been turning up ever since. This place, Lark Quarry, houses something quite different and quite unique. Not a skeleton, not even a bone. Body parts are the types of fossils that grab the headlines, but these aren't the most plentiful type of evidence. Trace fossils provide evidence of life in a different way, and here it's in the form of footprints. More than 3,000 of them, the panicked footprints of a dinosaur stampede. Here is evidence that dinosaurs gathered in herds, massive herds. Here are the traces of around 150 two-legged dinosaurs running for their lives. Some of the stampeding mob were emu-sized ornithopods, and some chicken-sized theropods like the celerosaur. If you multiply the length of a footprint by around five, you get the approximate height at the hip. And that's how we know that the celerosaur was built like a chook. He was running from a bigger theropod, whose hip was at least one and a half metres off the ground. Now, one theory is that he was running from Australovenator wintonensis, whose name means Southern Hunter from Winton. A few days after the stampede, it rained. Before the mud had dried enough to crack, the lake rose and covered the footprints with sandy sediment. Floods lay down further sediment, and as millions of years passed, the sediment layers were compressed to form rock. We are able to imagine the time of the Winton dinosaurs, around 95 million years ago, because of the bones, the trackways, and the fossil evidence that has been found in this part of Queensland.
These clues paint a picture of a world so far from our own. However, the discovery of each new Winton dinosaur was made possible by that chance find of a sauropod femur. The discovery of Elliot, the success in locating his remains, and the knowledge that Australia does have a rich dinosaur heritage has revolutionised Australian dinosaur paleontology. This knowledge and the great public enthusiasm following the new discoveries has led to the development of the Australian Age of Dinosaurs Museum of Natural History. And in the past decade, it has amassed the largest collection of Australian dinosaur fossils in the world. When we first started, we were just going to build a little tiny museum in town, but we soon became aware that what we had out here was the vast majority of Australia's dinosaurs. But the other reason is that we knew that unless we actually got in and did something about it, it was never going to happen. And these things were never going to come out of the ground in our lifetime or even our kids' lifetime. But more than that, you've got your kids, you know, you want your education side of it, there's this research side of it. All of those things, not just great for Australia, not just great for paleontology, but keeping these little regional centres alive. So it was just the greatest thing that we could do for our community, we thought, was to start the Australian Age of Dinosaurs Museum. The community responded, embracing the museum and the prehistoric creatures it had given to the world. The Winton dinosaurs have now become an integral part of the town's identity. The Winton community have been incredibly supportive, haven't they? That's right. It's, it's really exciting up there because you can see locals that are either local kids or, or landholders coming in and being involved physically with the excavation, the discovery, the preparation, the collection maintenance of all these fossils. So it's not something that's just the responsibility of us vertebrate paleontologists now. It's a completely open science policy where anyone who has an interest in it can be trained up and brought in off the street. And then you're contributing physically to Australia's natural history. And that's something unique. And it sounds to me it's almost like that the science wouldn't be progressing forward as quickly unless you had that volunteer base that we're getting from the local communities. Absolutely. I mean, I'm one vertebrate paleontologist and we're finding hundreds and hundreds of dinosaur bones. Uh, the fossils take months and months of preparation. If it was simply only a few paleontologists prepping these fossils, it would be literally decades before even one skeleton would have been prepared. One of the locals bitten by the dinosaur bug is Trish Sloan. Trish has an integral role managing the museum's preparation laboratory. I'm going to guess there's a little more to paleontology than just digging up bones. Just a little bit. Once we dig the bones up in the flat country out there, in the paddocks, uh, we then bring it into here and work on it. And how fragile are they? Like, how careful do we have to be when we're working with them? Uh, you look, you've got to be really careful. You've got to treat them with respect and care. So um, each dinosaur is different, so it depends what kind of preservation, how they came out of the ground. Wade, for instance, is one of the animals that we're working on right now and he is uh, encased in really hard rock. So we can go a little bit more heavy handed on it with some heavier tools, but if you prep too fast, you're gonna put the bone in danger, so you've got to do it carefully and slowly. So I've noticed some casts around the, around the bones. Do you yeah. do that out in the field? Yeah, that plastering is done in the field and that's a preservation method. We find the boundaries of the bone and then create a pedestal. And then once we create that pedestal, we then do three layers of material. So we put elf oil around first, then we put wet newspaper on it and that works in two ways. It keeps the soil moist around the bone and it also slows down the drying of the plaster so it doesn't break the bone inside. And then we apply hessian and plaster casting. It keeps it stored safely for however long it sits in our storage area. You must have a lot of bones here at the moment. How do you keep track of everything? Well, there's a lot of paperwork. Um, each bone that you see in our lab has got a conservation record and that conservation record will have everything listed on it from the number we give it in the field, it might get a, a fossil number which is for the whole dinosaur, it'll get a locality number, GPS readings, scientist notes. The more detail we have on that piece of paper, the better. And then when the scientists walk in, we can just go, here you go. And what's your favourite part of this job? You know, I've there's a lot of different elements that I love of it. The discovery of dinosaurs, the fact that I'm part of something so unique. I found my passion in life, 
Yes. You have a new baby. <laughs> My new baby. I've got lots of new babies. They're really big, though. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to use this tool. This is an air chisel, and it is the fastest and most productive tool that we have in our lab. All right, so what we'll do... I've got a lot of rock here on the side of the bone, so I'm actually going to use this flat edge to take off some of this rock. So that could be a bit of bone coming out in the side. So we'll go to this little one. This is an air scribe. This is the, the more commonly used tool in our lab. And we use this to, to do a little bit of detail investigating whether this is associated with the bone or maybe it's just a floater. And so a floater is just, say, a chip or fragment Float, of yeah. the bone? Yeah. Okay. We find bones in rocks because of water. Water seeping through the bones sets off chemical reactions causing the bones to become as hard as stone. The sediment in which the bones are buried is also turned to rock by the chemical reaction. With time, more and more layers of rock encase the bone, sealing and protecting it. Imagine Diamantinosaurus here. 18 metres long and over 20 tonne. Nothing remotely like him walks Australia today. Imagine this. A creature dies under just the right circumstances and a hundred million years later, you are the one who scrapes back the soil and sees it for the first time. How would you feel? Well, it's this excitement that brings people from all over the world whenever the digs are on. scheme of things, human beings have existed for only a brief moment in time. We've ruled the roost for less than a hundred thousand years. The giants, well, they swaggered around lords of all they surveyed for more than a hundred million years. Great big things as we've seen, and others. Like Minmi here. Small, armoured and with a horny beak for picking off fruits and seeds. Uncovering the dinosaur story is what the digs are all about. The digs out here in Winton are organised Winton style by Judy Elliott. So you find a bone out here, then how on earth do you go about organising a dig? We don't do a lot of advertising, but we've been doing it now for years. The Queensland Museum started us off. So we got a few diggers from there and pretty soon some of those diggers became duggers, having... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you go from a digger to a dugger? Here, yeah, once you've had your first dinosaur dig, you're it. You're a dugger. So they're not all scientists, they're not all paleontologists. Do you have volunteers? Not, not in the least. We've had policemen, we've had cooks. We just get them from all scales. Like, logistically, how do you get it together? Because how many people do you have out here? For the actual, we usually have 13 to 14 diggers. And then we have, well, it's David and myself. Sometimes one of our two sons are there. And then two or three staff from the Age of Dinosaurs. And we'll often have a Queensland Museum representative or a couple. And we have our own paleos who don't actually work for us. They volunteer. What is a typical day to dig? Well, 7 o'clock, 7.30, breakfast. 8 o'clock and everyone's out the door and then we get to the dig site and we go straight into the pit and they pick their spots. You just dig away. These bones that you've got out here, they're, they're priceless. So who does the training? They're rock. Unless you really hit them with a sledgehammer, you can't do a lot of damage. And let's face it, we all can do a little bit of damage, but if you don't get in there and, and have a go with the team, you're not going to see them. You're not going to find them. And so 
they'll still be in the ground. But as soon as people see that there is bone there, everything slows right down. And then you're using the little tools, so you don't have to be an expert to do it. You just need to be considerate, I suppose, of, of what you're finding, of what you're working with. David Elliott's discovery and all the work that he and his supporters have done since have put Winton on the dinosaur map. But this little town has another claim to fame. On a property not far from here, a poet named Andrew Barton Patterson, or Banjo Patterson, penned the most famous lyric in Australia. It was here he wrote Waltzing Matilda. One of Australia's most widely known bush ballads, Waltzing Matilda tells the story of a swagman camped by a waterhole. But there's more than one famous banjo and Matilda in Winton. On most digs, they discover a bone or perhaps a partial skeleton. But on one dig, they discovered the remains of two different dinosaurs buried together in what was once an ancient billabong. These are the remains of the two creatures the Australian Age of Dinosaurs Museum has fondly named Banjo and Matilda. Can you tell me more about them? Did you find them? No, I didn't actually find Banjo and Matilda. They were found by a lady who lives the other side of Winton, probably 150 kilometres away from us. And uh, she rang Judy and I up and said, there's this great big bone at the ground, come and have a look. There was a huge sauropod dinosaur. But not only that, there was a stranger in the pit with her. And it was within our first dig, we found a couple of little bones, you know, and we realised that there was something pretty exciting there, because it was definitely not Matilda. And when we kept going, of course, there's a beautiful sauropod dinosaur in there. So it's a carnivorous dinosaur right beside Matilda, so two dinosaurs for the price of one. Banjo is the first carnivorous dinosaur known by more than one bone or one scrap of bone in Australia. That's all that's ever been found before. Suddenly we had teeth, we had claws, we had jaws, we had so all limb the bones, a whole hands. The most complete specimen of a carnivore that's been found to date? In Australia, definitely. Uh -huh. And Matilda was exactly the same. She was the most complete specimen of a sauropod that we'd found to date. So what were they doing so close together? Well, you can have all sorts of interpretations, can't you? You just got to look at the science and think, well, what is, what's possible, what's not? And really, there's only several things that can be possible. One day, the Australovenator nicknamed Banjo chanced on a Diamantinosaurus known as Matilda. She was stuck in the mud and sensing an easy kill, Banjo pounced. sure that Matilda killed Banjo? Well, of course we don't, but then that's the intrigue of paleontology. Investigating the deaths of Matilda and Banjo around 98 million years ago is similar to a homicide detective today poring over the evidence and tracking down a murderer. So how do we weigh out this evidence? We've got more sauropods than anything. Pretty well most of the dinosaurs that we find are sauropods. I often used to wonder, why aren't we getting all sorts of dinosaurs in our deposits? And then it really started to occur to me as what exactly those deposits are. And those deposits are ancient silt deposits. They're the bottom of muddy water holes, basically, just like this one. We're seeing large animals that are coming down to here, they get a drink, and they're not coming back out again. And you'd have to wonder why that is. And then to do that, you've really got to look at the sauropods. And you're looking at the largest animals that ever walked the earth. They're 30 tonne animals. They've got no real enemies. A mob of sauropods are virtually indestructible. Nothing could have touched them, but by the same token, they got old. Nothing lives forever. And animals, as they get old, they get frail. And I find that with my sheep and my cattle. And when they do, and they start walking into a water hole similar to this, often they don't come out again. And what happens is they go in for a drink and they can't pull their legs out of the mud. And sometimes, if you don't get back to a dam for, say, three or four days, and a sheep has died on the edge of the water, wild pigs will come along, clean them up, and you'll find a few leg bones. And you imagine a huge, big, you know, 
20 or 30 metre long sauropod dead here and scavengers coming down and pulling away at it. They'd pull the neck away, they'd pull the tail, you just get a few scraps and a few limb bones that are, that are all down in the mud. So that's why we only find the leg bones of the dinosaurs Well, it's, it's probably the reason we find more leg bones than anything else. Doesn't look that deep, does it? No. You just watch this. Oh, my word. So that's how much mud is there that's just settled out of this water. Uh huh. So a 30 ton sauropod so You Callan imagine a 30 ton sauropod, there. <laughs> and he isn't got to sit up on top like we are. He's just going to go straight in. They called this fellow Wintona Titan. Titanic, 16 metres, 15 tonnes. The name means Winton Giant, in honour of the place it lived and roamed. David Elliott, continuing the family business of grazing sheep in this part of the world, one day stumbled upon a monster of a bone. It changed his understanding of the country around him, and it changed our understanding too. It helped us picture an ancient landscape that was once here and see the terrible footprints of the monsters that once lived in the outback. We've just started to understand the scale and richness of Australia's buried dinosaur past. To tell the story of Banjo and Matilda, understand the footprints of Lark Quarry, learn more from every dig, every fossil, every fragment. All because David Elliott, mustering sheep, recognised something that wasn't a rock. Without knowing this, we wouldn't have any clue about the huge dinosaurs that have been found right now. So now we're right at the start of this great period of discovery in natural history. I call it a natural history revolution. Because elsewhere in, on, on Earth, in different countries, they've had 150 years of finding big dinosaurs. Now it's Australia's turn, and we've just started. Understanding the time of the dinosaurs tells us about our remote past, but it also explains how our world has changed, how our climate has changed, and how the slow, unending course of nature continues to change our planet. It's difficult to think of anything more important than understanding how our world works, because if we are truly to understand where it's going, first, we need to understand where it's been. The Australian outback is a harsh and unforgiving place, but I think I'd prefer it like this than sharing it with monsters. Mm -hmm.